Thank you very much, Jim, for this. I think it's a very important uh, uh, remark to take into consideration the fact that there needs to be some kind of a framework, maybe agreement, maybe strategic framework, as uh, G7 just mentioned very recently, something needs to happen. Speaking of the G7, which was just hosted by Japan, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. William Saito, Special Advisor to the Cabinet and Prime Minister of the Government of Japan. Named by Nikkei as one of the 100 most influential people for Japan, Saito began software programming at an early age and started his own company in high school. By the time he was named Entrepreneur of the Year in 1998 by Ernst & Young, uh, NASDAQ and US Today, he was recognized as one of the world's leading authorities on encryption, biometric authentication, and cyber security. After selling his business to Microsoft, he moved to Tokyo in 2005 and founded Intecure, a consultancy that identifies innovative technologies, develops global talent, and helps entrepreneurs become successful. In 2013, Saito was appointed as a special advisor to the Cabinet Office of the Government of Japan. He is a foundation member of the World Economic Forum and has been named as the WEF as both a young global leader and global agenda council member. Ladies and gentlemen, William Saito, please. Good morning. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, it is also a tough job to follow uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, as I will be uh, providing somewhat of a counterpoint on uh, some of the discussions that had gone on. So uh, as, as I'm in Israel, I, I understand that we like debate. Um, how to do this in 12 minutes, I'm not sure. But my title here on stability in the international cyber domain, uh, I really want to go on the concept of redefining this trust. And if we look at the history of the internet, uh, we understand that, and many of you know that this is not a recent phenomenon, that the internet has existed in some manifestational form since 1969. Uh, it's not a recent thing. And if you look at the graph here on the chart, uh, you see a huge growth or uptake in the internet. However, my argument here is that it wasn't necessarily, of course it was catalytic, but it wasn't necessarily the invention of the World Wide Web that created the adoption of the internet. My hypothesis here a lot is that uh, what was a catalytic event was around 1995, we have the uh, advent of the SSL, Secure Socket Layer, compounded with RSA becoming publicly available in 2000, where you see the rapid adoption of the internet. And the reason I bring this up is it's not ICT that's driving security. It's actually security that's driving ICT that security is the fundamental enabler of the internet which allows everybody here to do what they do. Before, frankly, it's an academic tool. It's a means of communications. It was a means of open communication. It was never designed for this. It was that cybersecurity evolved and innovated and with the internet allows this to become a business tool. The counterpoint to this is, of course, if security does not keep up, the internet and its growth and its utility to society will stop. This is a concern, uh, especially uh, with one of the reports that just came out uh, three weeks ago. And this report uh, is one of many, but this one highlights it to a point. It was released by the Department of Commerce, and it was a three-year study. And the highlights of this report shows that in the United States, for example, 45% of internet users are curtailing or changing their online activity due to lack of confidence and security. Now this is frightening because here we've spent all this effort, all this energy to create this great infrastructure, this great tool for mankind, yet we're already now having significant portions of the population becoming worried and changing their activities. And so as a country and as a, a global audience, I think it's very important to understand that we're at the cusp here of seeing this get away from us or an opportunity to fix this. Having said that, uh, not only countries like Japan, but going around the world and, and talking to people at conferences like this and having done cybersecurity or information security for over 25 years, everywhere from starting off as coding to teaching cybersecurity to being an executive at a cybersecurity company and now doing policy, uh, 
being a multi-stakeholder, I, I, I've noticed something in talking to professionals in this industry for quite a long time. And, and, and we call this kind of like the ABCs of security. It kind of dovetails with uh, Dr. Lewis's presentation earlier, but I think we're looking at this from a fundamentally different lens. The ABCs of security is being uh, atomic, B, biological, and C, chemical. And a lot of countries, and looking at the GGE, we try to and tend to play cybersecurity within the framework or the metaphor of this ABC. But if you look at it and you talk to many people and why we're really struggling with this concept, the next letter D is causing lots of headaches and turmoil. And this is just because D is fundamentally different and it's dangerous sometimes to apply the ABC principles to a D concept. So why is that? I don't need to reiterate and get into too much detail, but it's obvious that cyber is not constrained by physics that we've had this, and many of the prior speakers have spoken about this, it moves at the speed of light, literally. Uh, it happens from anywhere, but also what's interesting that's not possible with the, all the other ABCs uh, is that it happens simultaneously. Uh, from what I'm seeing and talking to people and the concerns that people have is it's really now no longer a cold war, but we've changed to a cold war. Uh, I do think that while GGEs and track one discussions are very, very important, the issue that we have here is that in ABCs where we had rational actors or somewhat rational actors to be able to talk about this and discuss this in, 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 in decent, formative ways, that non-state actors and other professionals do play a role here that have upturned the rules and have made things difficult and, and, and are not like uh, the past. So for me, I think that the involvement of the non-state actors, we are really, when we're discussing cybersecurity, in a track 1.5 type of world. Uh, obviously, attribution is of an issue. Uh, and at the same time, the attacks here, and this was mentioned by other speakers, is very asymmetric. That we can spend a lot of effort defending our networks, and even if we're able to attribute who the attackers are, the traditional means of getting back and retribution and so on may not be as effective because of the asymmetric nature. And so asymmetric in the cyber domain has many, many, many different uh, aspects. The other interesting aspects of this is how policy does progress here, uh, sometimes in frightening ways, sometimes in interesting interest, issues. Uh, I think that this conference is timely because just last week, uh, NATO had just announced and recognized that cyber is another domain, that it is now treating cyber, just last week, that cyber is just like air, sea, and land. And so when we have this, and we have this progress here where cyber is evolving both at a policy level, at a technical level, not necessarily in sync, we live in very interesting times. I am proud to say, though, that uh, this year, Japan was the host to the G7 presidency. And to its credit, uh, up to now, in, in uh, dialogues like the G7 and G7 summits, uh, unfortunately, cybersecurity had never taken that great a role. Uh, last year, I think we had about a paragraph. Uh, I am proud to say that uh, this year's G7, cybersecurity was reflected with 505 words, about a page and a half. But it's, it's important to note here some of the key terminologies that we're using here, that it is understood that there are non-state actors that have to be dealt with. Uh, this includes terrorism, obviously, but also how this fits into the context of international law. And this will be going and an ongoing issue for not just the G7, but for other countries as well. Uh, I, I can't emphasize this further. Having been in this industry for over a quarter century, the actors are definitely changing. Uh, when I started out in this industry, maybe it might have been a little bit too early. Uh, it was the script kiddies, it was the teenage hackers, it was the people who wanted notoriety, it was the people that were just, just causing headaches. A lot of people tend to still think that cybersecurity is this realm, but honestly, it has completely changed to professionals that are well-funded, that are persistent, uh, and that are in there for different motivations. And to make matters worse, the outcomes and the developments that these people do, the millions of dollars that these people spend on R&D, can quickly be recycled and used for basically free by the other actors in this system. And so 
I argue that while track one and nation states and discussions like that are very important, a lot of the damage right now being caused and cause concern and losing of really the, the confidence of the general public tends to be non-state actors and we also have a dual mission here of addressing this issue. The other issue here that I have uh, a real concern about uh, and a lot of the other speakers have mentioned this is that many policymakers, many governments, many people in general tend to think of cybersecurity as a logical uh, attack uh, and it is not. I won't go into this as the other speakers have mentioned this, but it is clearly kinetic. It is clearly a physical uh, issue. Cyber does not necessarily mean logical. And given that Japan will be hosting the Olympics in four years time, this is a concern of mine where cyber is clearly linked to other risk issues such as physical that uh, I think not only from a, a, a nation state perspective, but companies, individuals, these things will just be a growing concern that we need to address. I will digress here a little bit. Uh, this is an important story. About five years ago, on March 11th, uh, Japan suffered the second uh, largest recorded earthquake in humankind, and we had a nuclear accident. Uh, I was uh, kind of at the right place at the right time, I suppose, if you call this, and asked to participate in the National Diet's investigation of this accident. Uh, we have a report and so on. My talk here is not about this accident, though. What I found interesting, though, was I am not a nuclear expert, uh, being of a cyber background, I thought I'd take it upon myself to understand the genesis of accidents, risk, and, and these kinds of threats. And what you find out when you look at historical accidents and historical uh, incidents, like the nuclear accidents, like other big recorded events, you end up and notice that there are common attributes. There are three common attributes. One, people make mistakes. Two, machines break. And three, you know what? Accidents happen. This is important to know because what people need to realize in this complex world that we live in is there is no such thing as 100%. And that frankly, failure is normal. I hate to say this. It's going to, it's going to break. And so what I am also now harping on is the importance of this concept of resilience. And this concept of resilience is actually a very sometimes cultural uh, issue in that it's very difficult for some people to actually comprehend this concept, especially when you go for black or white, if you go for perfection, or if you go for this level of detail. And I'll tell you my personal experience. I was actually asked in 1998 by the uh, Federal Reserve to be part of a commission for the year 2000 problem. And so we are trying to solve the year 2000 problem. As many of you, we've spent millions and millions of, if not hundreds of million dollars, overcoming the year 2000 problem and the world still exists. I must say that right after the year 2000 problem, we were uh, then questioned by many uh, people in uh, authority and wondering, was that really necessary? Did we need to spend that much money? Did the year 2000 problem really even exist? It kind of reminds me of cybersecurity today, right? If you, if you don't do it, you're, you're screwed. If you, if, you, if you do it, you're screwed anyway. What was interesting, though, about this was soon thereafter, uh, the year 2000, uh, what was interesting is 9-11 happens. And 9-11, as we all know, uh, was an attack on the financial institutions of the United States. Yet, the Dow Jones comes back, people are able to download and get in, uh, cash from their ATM machines relatively quickly thereafter. I will tell you what was amazing about this that I was able to see firsthand was that soon right after, minutes after 9-11, what the financial community did was pull out the year 2000 manual and create that resiliency to get back the financial systems of the United States. And so I talk about this a lot because it's very, very important. And the point and the moral of this story is if we need to be aware of cybersecurity, cybersecurity can be that resilience for a country to not only become stronger, but useful in other areas. And so I leave that as a feedback. The other concern is, and using Japan as a, a metaphor here, is that competitiveness and efficiency is very, very directly related to ICT. That we have these measures that show that if your country does not get ICT, uh, it, it will be in, in, in more dire straits and it becomes very important. Yet a lot of the people and why 
companies and organizations and countries do not implement ICT tends to be the fear of cybersecurity. So it's important to actually get past this to understand competitive issues and so on. So this is not just a negative whack-a-mole, but it's important for our company's country's competitiveness uh, going forward. The other thing here, because I'm running out of time, I'll do this really quickly, is security if done right, if done by design, actually makes things better. It increases performance, it increases efficiency, it will become a differentiator for not only countries, but businesses, products, and services. In order to do this, security has to be thought of as really a triangle, and a lot of people forget this. Obviously, you want security. You want to do it in some sort of cost measurement. But what a lot of people forget when doing security, including countries, but of course companies, and individuals, is that you cannot give up usability. Many, many, many cyber incidents that I see around the world, that I talk to, that I work with people, are actually not security issues, they're usability issues. And so without understanding and balancing this triangle, as I call this, it's very difficult to actually do cybersecurity right. And so as countries, this is very much important to understand, or else your companies, your people can, can just copy and paste the server away and go elsewhere. Finally, uh, I think that we have discussions like cloud, big data, internet of things, uh, fintech, blockchain, AI, machine learning. These are actually all grounded in cybersecurity. It's what makes this possible and so on. There are lots and lots of issues. Uh, I'm actually even over time right now, but there are many, many things to talk about, including education. But as a country, as conferences like this, I uh, encourage and I look forward to speaking to many and all of you on these topics because it is multifaceted and that we're only just scratching the surface. But uh, that is my presentation. Thank you very much.